Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome you all to today's session of the McLean Center 29th Annual Interdisciplinary Faculty Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Eric Whitaker, and the topic for this year, as you all know, who've been to sessions is health disparities, local, national, and global. Uh, this event, in addition to being sponsored by the McLean Center, is co-sponsored by the Urban Health Initiative, uh, which I lead, the Go Global Health Initiative led by uh, Dr. Fumi Olapati, and the Robert Johnson Foundation's Finding Answers Disparities Research for Change led by Dr. Marshall Chan. I, I get to be Mark Siegler for just a moment <laughs> and want to advise you at, at the conclusion of uh, Dr. Greer's remarks, we have this microphone which is for recording, not amplification. Uh, I get the pleasure <laughs> of introducing a good friend, Dr. Pedro Jose Joe Greer, also known as Dr. Joe. His official title is Assistant Dean of Academic Affairs at Florida International University, where he's leading the effort to transform medical education with this relatively new medical school. At FIU, he's aiming to develop highly skilled, ethical, culturally competent physicians who are socially accountable to their communities. He can talk to U.S. presidents as he's counseled the last three, as well as the homeless man in his clinic. So he, he has a, a very common touch. Uh, Dr. Joe's work on healthcare, homelessness, and poverty has earned him the MacArthur Fellows Award. And just a year ago, he was granted the Presidential Medal of Freedom by, doc, um, by President Barack Obama, which, as you know, is America's highest civilian honor. I give you uh, Dr. Greer, who is one of America's medicine's true change agents. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, thanks, sir. Eric, thank you very much. I actually have, I'm wired here, as they say. I'm, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for the snow. I mean, I'm a, a Cuban Irish, that's my background, so you want minorities and disparities. The, the question is, has American medical education kept up with the needs of America's health? I think this would be probably the shortest lecture in the world and I could just turn around and say no. And that's the end of my talk. But actually what I wanted to do today was to present to you the reason why we need to change the whole direction of medical education, equally as important because we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Fleckner Report, or the Carnegie Report, which was in itself an inherently racist and sexist report. So the, the state of Florida's 50th in uninsured adults, 49th in uninsured children. Miami-Dade County, which is the county of, of, uh, that houses the Miami Heat, the Marlins, and the Dolphins, has one of the highest uninsured rates in the country. In 2002, we had 26% of our population was uninsured, whereas in the rest of the United States, it was only 18%. Infant mortality in industrialized nations, we rank last. Life expectancy from birth of industrialized nations, we rank last. Where is it that we turn around and say, what is our responsibility as medical educators to turn the system around to produce what we need? We have simply become a country, like myself, I did internal medicine, chief medical resident, hepatology, gastroenterology. I was trained in one organ. But I get paid 10 times more than the person that's trained to take care of the entire body, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. So what have we become? We've become a nation that won't let you die, but allows you to go back out and suffer. We've been so concentrated on what we do and we base ourselves out of hospitals that we're the real causes of disease, we're not addressing. We're addressing the consequences of these diseases. You want to go, 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 go for it. Do whatever you need to do. So because of that, we continue to train the way we do. Medical schools in this country have become battleships and swimming pools with very difficult to change direction, but we add things on. Regardless of the suggestions from the AAMC, the Institute of Medicine, <coughs> going back six years when the Institute of Medicine recommended in one of their brief reports that social sciences and community-based education be integrated into medical education for all four years of a student's education. Ethics cultural competency, the ability to work in uh, teams, things that our profession has had a problem with, ethics. I'm from South Florida. We rank number one in the country in Medicare fraud. We're good. We are. We bring those prices twice as high as anybody else. And they make millions, and that's because now there's no mortgage fraud. 
So that's the only thing that was left. So we maintain it that way. The ethics in the profession, I've been bouncing between academics and private practice. Let me tell you, from where I come from in South Florida, there's some huge ethical issues that deal with, whether it is the conflict of how they make the money, how they bill, how they take care of patients. In today's modern world, we're taught to our, we teach our students that you're not allowed to abandon a patient. This has all been sort of played around with as you have different HMOs and different panels. But now we have an economic downfall. downfall. Patients lose their insurance because of their employment. Physicians where I come from refuse to see them unless they pay. That is not only an ethical and a moral issue, but I would even go as far as to say it has to be a legal issue. And one that we need to address seriously within our profession and to educate our students not to do that. Why? Because it's just wrong. And we need to be the examples that show the students how we do this. You want my code? 1428. You can break in any time you want. <laughs> It's also my home address, so. <laughs> so anybody can figure it out. I mean, I, I'm like a real bad techie, folks, okay? <laughs> it's, it's called a keynote. And so as we try and educate our students, we're sitting there saying, well, what are we doing wrong? Where, where has it fallen? When it comes down to the table to sit down and develop what we're doing, I bring in a lot of money as a gastroenterologist and a hepatologist. Okay. Okay, don't, what do I touch? Okay, that was the no, let me, that was the conclusion of my talk. Where are we? Okay, the consequences of the problem from Florida and the American perspective. These were the statistics I was giving you about the uninsured and uh, Okay, nobody touch anything else, all right? <laughs> this is the rankings we were going through, life expectancy. Oh yes, I almost forgot the Rick Scott thing. Capacity, that's something that we as medical educators and in the medical education can control. There's a huge capacity issue. If we are to treat the entire population of this country, we don't have the physicians to do it. We haven't developed the new medical schools that are needed from 1960 to 1980. We almost doubled the output of medical students or physicians, then we stopped. Then we made everybody a specialist. So what ended up happening? Well, in the state of Florida in 2008, every other year, allopathic physicians have to be licensed yearly, osteopathic physicians. And these were the statistics that came out from the state of Florida. There's over 51,000 uh, MDs in the state of Florida and almost 5,000 DOs. 77% are males, 78% are white, non-Hispanic males. Only one-third are between the ages of 25 and 45. 13 will greatly reduce or leave their practice of medicine in the next five years. 60% of all practicing OBs do not deliver children anymore. 14% said they will quit doing it in two years. And the average age of a male MDs in the, in the state of Florida is 52 and women is 48. There's no way we can handle the capacity and the flow of patients that are going to be coming in. The number of patients, uh, physicians in the state of Florida that are reducing taking Medicare and forget Medicaid we are one of the worst states in the country in Medicaid reimbursement. We're at about 59%. So we even have a lawsuit going on right now by pediatric cardiologists against the state to be able to take care of these patients. All of these things are going to just be set on the back burner as our new legislative uh, group got elected. I come from a very interesting state. Only in my state can we elect a senator who in Spanish will tell you why the Arizona immigration laws are too soft and why we should be an English only country in Spanish and he gets elected okay that is the state I come from a state which is a majority minorities yet we're not represented anywhere near that in our profession less than six percent of physicians in the state of Florida are Hispanic they're all in Miami there's two in Orlando <laughs> and about a a little over 5% are African Americans. We're from the South, where we have probably the largest population of minorities, yet we don't, are not represented in our schools and in the professions that we have. So what do we decide to do about it? Well, first we have to address what are the hidden agendas in medical education today. Let's be very frank. The statistics show it. We don't have to say it's not there, it is. Number one, underrepresented minorities, okay? we're not very well represented. 
especially the Cuban Irish group. <laughs> it makes you Cubish. <laughs> That's one poor small Catholic island corrupt to another one. The uh, less than 15% of students in American medical schools are from underrepresented minorities. It's less than seven and a half percent of medical faculties. The medical students, and this is the breakdown, 6.4 in the United States are African American, Hispanics are 6.4, American Indians, Alaskan, Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islanders less than 1%. In the year 2000, the American Association of Medical Colleges had a goal of 3,000 underrepresented minorities. Eric said it perfectly, they got the numbers wrong. Their goal was by 3,000 to have 2,000. Because <laughs> in 2007, we didn't quite meet that number. The other hidden agenda in medical education, primary care. One of the young faculty members I, I just recently hired, who happened to have graduated number two in her class at Brown, uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean woman, who wanted to go into family medicine, told me how she was called into her dean's office and sat down and told, you're number two in your class. You're way too smart. Why do you want to go into family medicine? When you rotate in the hospitals and you're doing a primary care rotation, the frustration of primary care doctors because of the inequities in pays, distribution, or even the ability to sit at the table and make decisions will discourage students from going into primary care. So we ourselves that do primary care, which I have despecialized, we're discouraging our own students from going into what is mostly needed in this country. We also need, if we're going to properly do this, is define exactly what is the role of a primary care doctor in American society today. To what extent do they go, to when do they refer, to when do they not refer, and we need to train this and do this, but we need to do it in a way that it's emphasized, where it's not the neurosurgeon that's the only king or queen of the medical faculty, but it, the primary care doctor that's doing the yeoman's work, that's turning around, that needs to have this emphasized, because why did I go into hepatology? Well, for a couple of reasons. Because we as Cubans had twice the instance of hepatocellular carcinoma, turned out to be hepatitis C. And because of Dr. Eugene Schiff. Because he was like the happiest doctor I ever met in my life, so it must be livers. <laughs> and he also taught us that an alcoholic was anybody who drank more than a hepatologist. <laughs> we have insufficient numbers of primary care, maldistribution of physicians throughout the country, complete lack of representation from the underrepresented minorities in our communities. And we, as medical educators and as institutions, are accountable for what we produce and put out in this country. And the country then has the consequences of what we do. I can go through all the different things from the Liapi Institute out of Harvard, from the Macy Foundation, the Carnegie Institute, all the different meetings and, and uh, organizations, the New Horizons Conference, which brought in all the medical schools, the ABIM Foundation Forum, the Institute of Medicine Report on enhancing the behavioral and social science content of medical curricula in the year 2004. That's been sitting on the shelf for a while. And Butler, out of Baylor, said in 91, academic medicine has entered a new and stormy season of accountability and social responsibility due to the public concerns about the overall health care system. When the reality is, and this was said by one of the, and I forgot his name, he was the Minister of Health and Welfare <coughs> in Canada. If you really want to reform the health outcomes of a country, the health care system is nothing more than a bit player. It is the social determinants, it is the social policies that are the public policies. But we become the agents that see these issues and have to turn around and fight for the legislative appropriateness of what is passed. Obligations derive implicitly from the generous public funding and other benefits medical schools receive. Schools' primary obligation is to improve the nation's health. The obligation is carried out most directly by educating the next generation of physicians, biomedical scientists in a manner that instills appropriate professional attitudes, values, and skills. There is no medical school in this country that is not heavily funded by the tax dollar. And as such, because we are, we have an obligation to those that are paying for us to maintain these buildings and our educational system going. And that obligation, that responsibility, is the health outcomes of this nation. And we're not meeting them. We're not even getting close. We're actually getting worse. All medical schools have the obligation to educate future physicians who are prepared to assess and to meet the health care needs of the public. That was the Macy Foundation 2009. 
the head of the Macy Foundation, who used to be one of the uh, deans at the Harvard Medical School, also made a very an interesting quote when we met with him, which he said, American medical education has become a place where rich white kids go to become richer. And statistics bear that out, that the majority of medical students do come from affluent families. Having said that, you know, my kids have the benefit of private education. Of course, my daughter chose public interest law, so I could support her the rest of my life. That's, I thought that was really nice of her. But we're there. This obligation consists that all medical students retain their enthusiasm for medicine and commitment to societal mission. You guys got to keep the students pumped up and fired up. You have to be enthusiastic. The mission is too big. It is the responsibility of life and the health outcomes of this country. It's not just the political battles we fight within our own institutions. I'm Catholic too, so I know about all these politics. But it's how we turn around and portray this to the students. What can they do? Where can they go? What difference can they make to improve the health of this nation? The educational experiences, which we'll go through later, providing a physician workforce drawn from all sectors of American society. Educate medical students who are prepared to choose careers as generalists and specialists in adequate numbers and distributed appropriately. Foster greater interprofessional teamwork. Why is that? I don't know. When I was an intern, we used to round with the entire team, social worker, nurses, pharmacist. We don't do that anymore. We sometimes call them in on consultation. Most of us get out of medical school without even knowing the real functions of our professional colleagues that help us out when we need their help. Why are we not integrating that into the medical education, undergraduate and graduate medical education? So we added on a new competency. AAMC has six, patient care, medical knowledge, interpersonal communication skills, professionalism, system-based practice, practice-based learning and improvement. And at our school, we added social accountability as one of the major competencies we expect our students to graduate with. And we grade them heavily on both professionalism and social accountability. We're teaching them that this is not a game. They chose to come into medical school. This is the responsibility they have. Unprofessional behavior is unacceptable and reason for failure. And the same with social accountability. Why? Because that's the role that we have been given. And that's who we have to train our, our, our patients for, our uh, physicians for. Our social mission is to improve the quality of life of individuals, households, and community while educating men and women in medicine. Nancy Cantor at Syracuse said, I want to make this the case that civic engagement is not one more thing on the plate. It is the plate. It is the community. It is the country. It is everybody that lives within our borders that we are responsible for. The reality is we should be responsible for the whole world as physicians, but let's start off at home and work our way and get this done. It's not like we don't have to clean house. So what we did at the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine was we decided to have five major thematic strands throughout the four years of medical education. <clears throat> Human biology, disease, illness, and injury, clinical medicine, professional development, and medicine society, which is the strand I'm in charge of. When we were first hired and putting together this medical school, one of the things that I sat down with the dean was it's very difficult to hire faculty to become a, a member of a strand. I actually remember the very first time I sat down with John Rock, the dean, when we came in, he said, as opposed to strands, they were calling them themes. He hadn't quite explained this concept to me yet. And he brings me in his office and says, we want you to be a theme director. <laughs> I'm thinking, what is it, like Mexican night? <laughs> Italian night? What's the theme? And then we said that and went through this. And this makes perfect sense because we divide our medical school not into four years, but four periods with different time periods for the first, second, third, and fourth. We do organ-based system of learning when we teach. And we also have something else that we did was the department that we created to be able to fully do this medicine society. And so I sat down with them and we developed a department of humanities, health, and society. Three divisions within this department, which consist of medicine society, which is the curricular arm, community engagement and policy, which is the community arm, and family medicine. We took family medicine from being a department and we made it a division. Now somebody says, if you're so, par so you're pushing so hard for primary care, and generalists, why would you take a department and make it a division? Very few places in this country does family medicine have a big chair at the table. So what happens? Because of the hidden agenda, they're pushed back, their salaries are low, and you have a problem. Students get their six weeks of family medicine, family practitioners are frustrated, 
pay, the students don't get the exposure they need. So by making family medicine a division, it now became a four-year clerkship. So all students will have, as their mentor, because just for academics we are hiring one family or primary care doctor for every 10 students as mentors to educate these students. We also have a thing called Panther Communities because we're the Florida International University Panthers. So we have four Panther Communities. We're now beginning to integrate them with the different classes. We only had one. And they are responsible for community and civic activities, which they do as volunteers. All that is integrated also into the communities where they will be working. So the students are fully engaged, fully immersed, and trained and mentored by family practitioners. Now it also becomes important that as you hire your faculty, you represent what you need. Two of our three chiefs in our department are social scientists, they're not MDs. I have Averis Martinez, who we hired from uh, Hopkins, who is an anthropologist and in public health, and she's in charge of the curricular arm. Why is that? Because it's social sciences we're teaching, not the family medicine part. And uh, Lou Brewster, who just came back from Europe as the, uh, the uh, Marshall uh, uh, Fellow, for two months he was out there, who trained under Marmont in England, who is our community engagement chief. 50% of my faculty is women, 67% are underrepresented minorities. The interesting thing with all this, this composition was not made by design, but by application. We sat there and these were the individuals that were interested in leading this, with over half of them being Ivy League graduates. David Brown, who is the head of family medicine, who's brilliant, I was so glad he applied, because I told David, David, I need like one white Jewish guy, because I really don't have the diversity I need, who's come in and he has been just phenomenal with family medicine, turned it around. But as far as recruiting underrepresented minorities, you really need people that look like us, or talk like us, or have similar backgrounds to make somebody feel comfortable in an environment. It also becomes vitally important as we try to develop more physicians for South Florida, because we're a public university, as we're in the communities, that kids from these neighborhoods who have probably never seen a college student, or much less a graduate student, actually see those that come from the same background that they do. So showing them that, wow, this is all achievable. This is not something we cannot do. And as such, then we can start getting to the goals that we have uh, designed for ourselves. The Green Family Foundation, you donate a lot of money, you get your name, big letters, who gave us $8 million to start our department and do what we're doing, which is supposed to be matched by the state, but the state tells us they have no money. This is our signature program in medicine society, and it is the flagship of what we do at our medical school. We're going to expose our medical, nursing, social work, and other FIU students to social determinants of disease and health and provide services to medically underserved communities by harnessing FIU educational resources through our urban coalition. Medicine side, this is the curricular arm of the four periods. We start off with the ethical foundations and moral justifications of medicine. We expect our students not to become ethicists, but to become critical thinkers, to be able to at least predict some of the ethical conflicts that come across and some of the moral issues that they come across on a daily basis. Apart from that, we want to take it a step further. Which policy is unethical? Which policy has adverse effects on the outcome of a nation? As a gastroenterologist, the American College of Gastroenterology three years ago, because of the disparities in health care and because of a 25% higher rate of colorectal cancer in African Americans, is that me? Uh, and a 45% higher mortality rate set, changed our screening protocols, which were African Americans were to be screened at the age of 45 without any risk factors, the rest of the population at the age of 50 unless you had risk factors. The ethical dilemma that I present to the students is once we came out with this information, we presented it at Digestive Disease Week at the American College of Gastroenterology meetings, we published it in our journals, and that was it. You discover something that's killing people at higher rates than it should, isn't your obligation to go a little bit further than your own scientific community? Would it have not been appropriate for gastroenterologists in mass, or perhaps the whole medical profession in mass, to turn around and say, if the issue is that they're not being screened because coverage or capacity, we have to stand up and make sure legislation is changed so that they are covered and the people are there that are trained to be able to do these type of procedures to prevent a disease that is killing a population 
which we have seen through colonoscopies and screening, we've gone from number two as the number, number two uh, uh, killer of cancer in this country to number three. So yes, it does work. But still, with the disparities in healthcare, <laughs> we've completely eliminated an entire population. And in the South, one that is at extremely high risk for being uninsured, and that's African Americans in the southeastern United States. So yeah, ethically, we failed within my specialty. Because it's not good enough to make a discovery if you're a scientist. It's only good enough when you take that discovery that can help people and save their lives and make sure it gets implemented. Those are the ethical questions we want them to go through, not just patient-physician interactions, life and death, things of that nature. It's important that they understand all of these. We can talk to them about double jeopardy. We can talk to them about all the different things in ethics. But if people are dying when they shouldn't be, there's an ethical and a moral issue involved, especially since that's the profession we decided to be. From there, we go into the socioeconomic and cultural aspects of medicine. We're in Miami, folks. You name a culture, we have it. You name anything, we have it. And the students need to understand that. As we go th uh, speaking with them and they're talking to their patients about end-of-life issues, and they start talking to them about procurement of organs for possible transplantation. Well, there's certain cultures in Miami that that's just one of the greatest taboos. For example, within the Haitian culture. So that is not an issue you bring up to a family member that is dying or to family members of a patient that is dying in a culture that considers this taboo unless you've discussed with this at length. The Hispanic culture. We like to say Hispanics. Well, let me tell you something. There's a big difference between a Guatemalan and an Argentinian. And there's a big difference between a Chilean and a Colombian, a big difference between a Cuban and probably anything else. We've been sort of isolated. And there's many things we have in common. We have language. We don't have food in common. Call different cultural aspects we have very different. And it also depends on what generation you're in this country. If you're second generation or third generation, it's very different than the recent immigrants. These are day and night issues, and unless you understand these cultural issues, you're not going to get anywhere. Interprofessional approaches, and I'll go into how we did that. We actually have joint classes with nurses, social worker, and public health students. We also have the law school involved, and we're getting the hospitality school involved. Maybe we can teach how to be hospitable. It will really improve in the history when the patient feels comfortable. And they'll be able to tell you exactly what they feel, and guess what? you can make a, a better diagnosis and probably quicker. The foundations of community and team partnerships. And then from here, we're in the second period, which is generally uh, in March is when we start, communities, culture, and health, is when these students are then assigned households in the poorest communities in Dade County, and they're responsible for the health outcomes of these, of these households until they graduate. And then the families will graduate with the students. Because we expect not just the students out there teaching health issues or disease prevention issues, but these families to teach our students what are the realities here. This is not a clinic. They're going into the households. They're sitting there. They're seeing the environment where patients live. They're seeing the realities that they have every single day. They're seeing the difficulties that it might be in getting their 70-year-old patient in a household that's cluttered with boxes and steps that walks around and has a, a, the exposure to fractures and falls which they might not have realized if they weren't there. The fact that there's a two-year-old and they're putting the medicines for the rest of the family in a table that's this tall and the exposure to that child. They're looking into these neighborhoods. They're looking at their diets because we have nutrition too, which is not part of the actual uh, uh, teaching, but they come in and do assessments of the households to try and teach them how to eat properly based upon their cultural preferences. You could go into Miami and say, just read the labels. Well, our educational system's not that good in Dade County, so if you went through the Dade County public school system, chances are you're not going to read it. That's number one. Number two, the very impoverished, and particularly the immigrant communities that we have in Dade County, they buy things, and instead of buying a bottle of oil, they'll come in with a cup, and they'll fill the cup with oil. There's no labels. They can't afford a pack of cigarettes, so they'll buy one or two. They get a lot of products from Latin America. And we also find out they get a lot of their medications and health advice from Latin America or the Caribbean because they can't afford to go to anything here. We, we've come across diabetics that have had their medications but haven't seen a doctor in eight years, nine years. So we want to make sure that they're getting the best care possible as we try to assure all people in this country. 
they continue through this. Here in the fourth period, where they have electives and selectives, in the they, in, in part of the third period here, they also have an official family medicine clerkship. Starting in day one, they're assigned to different uh, community clinics with different mentors that they go through. Here, for every household visit, we actually have a faculty member at the household visit, which is either medicine, nursing, social work, or public health. And why do we do that? They've just started. And so while we're in there with the students, we're guiding them along. We meet with the students before, we have the household visit, we meet afterwards. They have to put plans together. They have to be able to tie these patients into the different systems. They'll find out that their patient that's 62 years old, although has Medicaid, has never had screening tests that they needed. They go through these lists. They teach them how to eat, how to take their medications. At the level before they get to a clinic and be referred to where they need to go to. And all of these components we do in the classroom, both formal and we have community classrooms where we actually take the students and we'll give them a formal lecture in a community-based organization outside of the actual School of Medicine. The workshops that we put together, the Health Science Pipeline Program, which the students are very active in, the community health centers, educational programs, and all the other community-based service organizations, the household visits, and then the service learning projects, and the capstone, which they present in their fourth year, which they have to present a project that they've put together to improve the health outcome of a household or an entire community. It doesn't have to be huge. It has to be innovative. It has to be well thought out. And as of right now, the students have come forward, and two of the students, very interestingly, have come forward and they've created a clinic in Little Haiti with the mass number of patients that we've received after the earthquake in Haiti and with no care that they have there. Because they were going to a community-based organization, and they noticed this, and particularly in the pediatric population, they came forward to us to do that. So that's what they're doing, and we're working very closely with public health. As a matter of fact, they're lending us their facilities to be able to do this. Throughout the four years of undergraduate medical education, students will address ethical and potential ethical issues, social, cultural, and non-biological issues in their clinical presentations. In other words, every single case that they have, no matter what organ system they're rotating through, reproductive, digestive, etc., we will have as their presentations questions on ethics, questions on social determinants, questions on all the non-biologic causes, how can affect it, what can be done. We have to have our students thinking in this wide manner to be able to truly address the problems and particularly of the underrepresented minorities and what they're suffering in the communities of Dade County. When we put together the curriculum, this was a job. Try and get the School of Nursing, the School of Public Health to change their curriculums to match yours. Try and get all these done, especially as I found out that since we decided to be the non-union college at the university, that worked out really easily with the union faculty from the other universities and getting all these things working together, getting them to have approved by their respective accrediting agencies to be able to do this. And of course, nobody has money. The reality is you could do this with very little money. It's a matter of changing curriculum, adjusting here and adjusting there. And the truth is we share when we get it. We're not a big revenue win winner yet. The programs that we're doing are purely educational. But as a gastroenterologist and running the clinical gastroenterology at the university, one of the deals I made was I get a percentage of those revenues for my department. And my department's also going to be the ones that are going to be doing the primary care for the university eventually. So there's, we can be innovative. Money can be shared. How do we teach? We teach with faculty, students, and community all together. And we try never to separate it. The hardest thing we found out was as we hired a lot of our faculty, getting them to understand the importance of what we're doing and to integrate it and just understand it as they go through what they're teaching. The basic sciences are important. I don't think they're as important as the basic scientists think they are. I think the clinical sciences are more important. Sorry, basic scientists. I did study physics as an undergrad, so I can tell you why an apple falls. But, uh, if you're producing this type of physicians, it's important to put the emphasis where you need to train your doctors. The ones that want to go into basic science research, they need to be emphasized in that area. Our characteristics of engagement in the community is intentional, impactful, synergistic. We align research, learning, and service to solve local, state, and national problems and long-term and sustainable. This is not episodic. If we go into a neighborhood, we're staying. The idea is not to go in, which is the tradition that we've had at least in South Florida, the university comes in, does a study, says it can do this, and then leaves. Nobody responds to that study. 
But if you respond to the community and you try and do as much as you can to be true community participatory research, the results become huge. Lou Brewster, who's uh, the, the chief here, put this together. We identify community assets. We identify service opportunities. We create community participation vehicles. We provide service and we value community trust. It really comes down to being that simple, to going into a community and earning the trust of that community. We go into a community, now the different ones we're going in, we set ourselves up two and a half years prior to bringing our students in there. We develop the community advisory team. Well, this is what we hope to do is educate our future uh, physicians while providing service to communities, learning opportunities to expose our students to the non-biological factors that influence health and disease, and community engagement and learning from the community, not just teaching a community. This is how we do it. I'm going to go a little quicker since I'm running out of time here. These are our learning objectives. This is what we hope to do, to educate our students to form interprofessional, intercultural, collaborative pro partnerships to improve the health of patients, households, and communities. Integrate students into medically underserved communities to develop social accountability and increase social capital in these communities. We explain to these students that they wear a white coat. They go into a community that has rarely seen a white coat. They join that community board. They've, uh, they, they're offering social capital. They're making an important impact just by doing that, whether they're students or physicians. Transform medical education to meet the needs of patients, communities, and society based on the ACGME general competencies and adding to the other competency, social accountability, which, by the way, the Canadian medical schools have done for years. And this is not done on south of their border, but it surely is north of it. And the last one is we expect our students to save the world. And we tell them that at the beginning. Set your goals high. Tell them the importance of what they're doing because it is, it is that important. And you then give them the tools to go out and make the world better. We coordinate this all this in households, neighborhood health centers, hospitals, community centers, as I had said earlier. The household visits I already went through. The organizations that we, we build, the, the community advisory teams are phenomenal. When we did our benchmark survey, we sat down with them, what are the questions you want to have? Which was very interesting because we had our staunch old basic scientists there that sat there in our research and IRBs. And I remember at one meeting, one of the, our most prominent faculty members, a world-renowned scientist, was shocked that we would suggest that as we were reviewing the data, the community participatory, with the community participatory research, we would have the community at the table. And I just remember him looking and saying, well, what do they take our data? And I'm thinking, what are they going to sell it for? What are you going to do with data if you're in a community? What are you going to do, sit in the corner and say, Psst, you want some crack? No, I got data. You want data? What else you need? I got it. This is Miami. It's not the season. I got lobsters. You want lobsters? The truth is, when you involve the community, they turn around right away. One of our community advisory team members who lost her job became one of our surveyors who stood up as we brought the president of the university and the dean to meet the surveyors so the surveyors could tell them what they were doing, turned around and said, now our school is a, is a big university. We're 45,000 students, undergraduate and graduate. So for the president of the university to be fully committed in this program is a huge, huge issue. It's from the top on down. And I remember her sitting there saying, I don't know why I got to go into a household with a stack of papers and sit for two hours asking questions. Until about the second or third week when I realized that everybody said yes to fruits and vegetables looked a lot better than everybody else. So now I just eat fruits and vegetables. Now how long has she known this? Forever. But unless somebody sees something, they're not going to do it. And she also talked about the household that she went into where the mother was kind enough to spend almost two hours with her in the survey while her 29-year-old daughter died, was dying of cervical cancer in the back bedroom. Where then she realized the importance of primary care and visits to a physician for screening. It's these stark realities that make it work. One of our community advisory team members came to us as we're putting together the data and wanted to know if she could present it with her pastor at their church, and they're 6,000 strong. This information needs to be in the community, and this information needs to be distributed by the leaders of the study, which happen to be not just the medical school, but the community advisory team. They are equal in the leadership and the study here. So when they present it, it has a much bigger impact than when Joe Greer goes into a community that I've been in there maybe 10 times in my life or 20 times where somebody lives there, and they know the commitment that they have. We have a uh, data coordinating center where we collected a population study, and this is what we did for our first benchmark. 
We went in, we got the demographics, be, uh, health behaviors, social capital, access to health care, social services, chronic disease management. Now what you're going to be seeing here, we went into four different communities. And within this community is a very diverse population. It's about 65% African American, about 25% Hispanic, and about 10% combination of, of anything. We have in the city of Miami Gardens in Opelika, this is famously known in Dade County as a triangle. It's one of the most violent areas of Dade County. And we chose the hardest hit area of Dade County because if we're going to make an impact, we have to make an impact in somewhere that counts. Security issues were at hand and all that and we resolved all those things. We actually go and work with the community and we have a police officer that goes around the neighborhoods when the students are there and we have a faculty member with the students when they're in the households. We did a, a benchmark survey on 29,000 households in Miami Gardens, 3,000 in Opelika, 14,000 in uh, Northwest Unincorporated Dade and there was a small quadrant which is known as the Jewish Northeast Quadrant which houses 3,800 Holocaust survivors. Now the, the, the interesting thing of this, the great majority of them are foreign born obviously that are there, but the foreign, and that's a, 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 a typo there, it's, <clears throat> they have come recently from a foreign country. All our Holocaust survivors are foreign born. And the majority are actually coming from Latin America and the Soviet Union. So we have a large population with a whole other language and other cultures involved. The irony behind that is in the city of Opelika there's a place called Bunch Park. Bunch Park is where <coughs> African American World War II veterans were designated to live after the war. So you have individuals that fought for the freedom of those that were being suppressed and brought back to this country in some of the most racist manners you can imagine right after World War II. Even if you look at the houses in Bunch Park, they're flat roofed houses. This is South Florida. This is the tropics. You do not have a flat roofed house. Not with the rains and not with the heat. It just doesn't work. But this is where we put this population. So the students are having families and get to interchange the stories and we bring them to give lectures to the students on two very interesting issues that will not be around very long but oral histories that the students have to understand. That history does not change that much. Racism continues to exist. There will be different other uh, massacres and holocausts in the world. And these are the type of things because of the profession they're going into and the leadership positions that they will be in, they have to guard against and fight against and when they go into communities, maybe they can help prevent a lot of these different things. So what we're trying to teach the students is just to be really the best physicians possible. Not just the brightest, but the best. The best physicians that will turn around and make the outcomes of this country where we don't sit last in infant mortality, but we sit first. We have a great pride because we're number one in what we're doing. Not because we're number one in infant mortality as far as just that's concerned, but in life expectancies, in opportunities for all, in making this country what it's supposed to be. This is what America's supposed to be about. Apparently the other professions aren't picking up the, uh, the slack here. So it's pretty much fallen on our shoulders. And why is that? Because no matter what the social problem is, it comes to our emergency room. Let me get over here. These have been some of the issues that we've had to deal with legal liability issues, safety of team members, interdisciplinary team management, trying to coordinate three students from three different colleges, faculty and a family when they can meet with everybody's schedule. We've had to hire two people just for that. <laughs> After the first visit it becomes very easy because at that visit they all schedule their subsequent visits. Training for the team visits. How do you train individuals to go into a household? This is not a clinic visit, this is somebody's home. The students are asking, well, can I do a physical exam? No, you cannot. Well, why not? Because we generally don't do physical exams in the dining room. And we don't do them on the couch. What if they need their blood pressure check? Well, ask them if they do, you could do that. If they're hypertensive or if they have new medications, then you can do that as you go along in your visits. Manage household and community expectations. Be honest with the communities. Let them know what we can offer and what can come back. If we're honest, it actually works. Faculty development, and the last one I put on there, which is boot camp for faculty. We're developing a three-day course on the importance of social sciences and social determinants and ethics in the teaching of medicine for all our new faculty. That way, they have a full understanding of what the flagship of the university is like, and we're not isolated into our little silos of why it's so important to learn about all hepatocellular dysfunctions. But 
the fact is that because of obesity in America today, as hepatologists, we predict non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH, will be the number one cause of cirrhosis in this country in the next five to ten years. Insulin resistance of the liver is the number one reason that you have the huge disparities in outcomes with hepatitis C and treatment with interferon and ribavirin. Where in a white population you have a 54% sustained viral response, in African American populations less than 20 and in Hispanic populations less than 25%. So yeah, social determinants do count a lot. Because if we can control these things, A, we could probably prevent the spread of disease, and B, we can prevent the, uh, the progression of the disease by having a sustained viral response to the virus. And hepatitis C is the number one killer of HIV patients, or it was in a recent study I read, on the east coast of the United States. This is the very first time we had all the students come together to make their presentations, divided them in four. This is Dr. Mark Rosenberg. He is the president of FIU. He is not only present at these conferences with the students and listens in, which was a big hassle too, because as the students are presenting cases, our attorney was going crazy with the HIPAA regulations. I said, you know, he's a Latin American expert. I don't think he really understands all the <laughs> disease entities we're talking about. But that's how engaged he is. There's our faculty members and our students, and that's our first class that we have. And so the real question is, what now? What do we do? It's about medical education. We have to relook at admissions criteria, the metrics that we use to admit students. If MCATs correlate wonderfully with USLME Part 1 and we're thinking about getting rid of Part 1, why the hell do we need the MCATs? Just a question. No, just, just sort of curious. What are the other criteria we're looking for to develop good physicians? What type of medical school should be doing what we're doing and which are the ones that should be doing pure science, basic sciences and research? Or should there be a combination? Our, our graduate medical education, that has to change too. We, uh, one of the uh, hospitals in Miami we work with, a not-for-profit, offers their hospital for our family medicine residency. I said, that's wrong. This should be an outpatient residency. It's primary care. They do need to rotate through hospitals, but these programs need to be based where we're going to be training our physicians. When I got done training at Jackson Memorial Hospital, which was the busiest public hospital in the country, and I was done with my internal medicine and chief residency, I could take care of you only if you were dying. If you had a cold, I had to look it up. You know, if your respiratory rate was less than your pulse, you were a wimp. You're not at the ER, okay? So that's what happens when we're trained in these environments. And you see these things, it's exciting, it's fun, you're involved in it, but it only takes care of the problem at the end. It doesn't prevent the illness. Service to our nations as physicians. You know what I'd love to see? I'd love to see required for all medical school graduates after one year of training, one to two years of service in underserved uh, under, uh, areas. This area, this is, goes for everybody, not just loan payback. This is every physician. The more underserved area you go to, the more points you get. That way, when you apply for your residency, that goes along with your board scores and your letters of recommendation. What a novel idea. Not only that, what do you increase? If we, what, what, how many medical school, stu uh, how many students do we graduate a year? 5,000, something of that nature? 4,000? So you all, you've just increased your workforce and capacity by doing that. Number one, you might get people actually interested in saving the world at that level. And they stay. And the other thing is, if you have medical students already doing this, and you have 18 to 20,000 medical students out there working in communities, you have an extra four to 10,000, if they do two years, in community serving this. We're dealing with the capacity issue. We're dealing with the disparities in health care. And we're training physicians to better understand this country and represent us as we should. NIH and medical school rankings. And one of the quotes that I had there about the amount of funding that goes into a medical school and, and medical schools rank themselves by NIH funding, then we have to get some really smart analysts to develop some sort of methodology that can actually measure the, the contribution a medical school has to its community, since the community is paying for it anyways, and use that as one of the criteria for NIH funding. Boy, will that change direction of education. So just think if we can apply these different things, the difference we'll make. And the reality is it's not that huge of a change that we need to do. The factors are all here in all the medical school. It's a matter of, and I say from the president to the deans to the chairs to the chiefs to all the faculty members to push this agenda 
and do it because if not, you guys, the health outcomes are just embarrassing. And we're going to be sitting here lecturing on these things. And Martin's never going to finish his studies because the disparities will never end. So what my job is to get you out of a job. Okay, so that way there are no disparities. But that in conclusion is what we're doing with the new medical school we have in South Florida. Some of the things we'd like to see in this country. And I'd like to thank you all very much for inviting me here. It's been quite an honor. Yes, sir. One of the, or two of the key metrics you had mentioned from the beginning and throughout is uh, uh, people going into primary care, so providing the sort of care that, that uh, the Americans need when they're not deathly ill. And the second was being willing to serve in communities that are relatively medically underserved. To what extent, obviously this is a very unique medical school, uh, maybe not unique, but not, not, not the median. Uh, to what extent do you think you're going to achieve that by recruiting people who are already bent in that direction and kind of giving them a place where they can, they can, they can follow that track versus taking normal, everyday, average medical students and encouraging them to go into primary care that might have, if they'd been here, gone into gastroenterology. That's assuming that your normal medical student doesn't have that interest. Well, that's what I, mean. I think that we need to do is instill that interest because you could still, and I'm not saying we don't need gastroenterologists, we need them. We need ophthalmologists. We need all the specialty cares because who are you going to refer these patients to? But you can't have <clears throat> your gastroenterologists that will only take funded patients and not take Medicaid or Ryan White or unfunded. You need your ophthalmologist that's willing to take care of the kids in these neighborhoods. You need the pulmonologist that is taking care of all the asthma, pediatric pulmonologist in the neighborhood that is being taken care of. And if we distribute, in essence, the wealth, as I would say, if everybody did their little part, we could resolve a lot of these issues. But we've got to get students back interested in primary care. That means changing how we pay. They should be paid a lot more than they are. I mean, I get paid for the amount of procedures I do. There's nobody that buys a car because this is the company that makes the most of them. So we're not being measured on how we perform, just how often we perform. So we need to change that too. And, and that's a whole lot of metrics. That's a whole other discussion, a whole other lecture. <clears throat> but we do need to go in those directions. Because if not, we're not going to stop rolling downhill. It's wonderful that we can transplant a liver. It's a lot more wonderful if we didn't have to. So set your goals in those directions. Will the disease continue to happen? Yes. Imagine the amount of money we'll save if we cut tr liver transplantations by 50%. And that money could be used for other areas of medicine. And transplant surgeons could sleep a little more. <clears throat> They'd be so much more pleasant. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it, yes, it's skewed towards that type of student. Our numbers and applications increase every year. We get over 4,500 applications. And this was for 40 slots. Next year it's going to be 80. And I really believe that most people, the overwhelming majority of those that go into medicine are truly altruistic. Because you're going to be going through a hell number of years without a social life. You better have a commitment that you want to do something with that. And I think that we can orient that. There's, no, there's, not, there's never going to be a poor doctor in America. There'll be a doctor that's poorer than some of the other doctors. But we're all in the top 5% of American income. That's pretty damn good. So we just have to instill these. And also in the admissions criteria, we have to make sure we get the right students. Just because they're the brightest student doesn't mean they're going to do the best for our society. And if our society is paying for their education, there's an obligation involved. Now, if they decide to become pure basic scientists that make these wonderful discoveries, let's go for it and continue that. I'm not saying get rid of that. I'm saying just change the orientation so that we could start producing the, the majority of our doctors to go in this direction. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, um, thanks so much for this very interesting talk and from the perspective of academic medicine I think that we've got a lot of folks in the room who are interested in working on these ideas around innovation but I'd like to uh, flip this a little bit and to talk a little bit about population health and specifically how you've been able to integrate the curriculum that you've developed into initiatives that may have developed through Miami-Dade County's Department of Public Health and what what those relationships are like. Well, we have a wonderful relationship with the Department of Public Health. As a matter of fact, their new building is being built right next to the medical school on our campus. 
So the Department of Public Health will become part of our medical sciences complex. So with their health initiatives and what they teach our students, actually one of the things we're trying to do is get our students certified in public health for those that don't want a master's because the amount of public health we put in there. But it's that the importance of their initiatives that the students have to understand so they get the better picture on how to take care of overall populations. That's an essential part of the curriculum. That's not an add-on. That, that, that's one of the bars that keeps it steady. And that's how we do that. And we, and we forged these relationships bef before. We, we sat down seriously, and it was a fun year because we sat down with competencies. Who do we need to get involved? Who do we need to track down? And this and that. And it's nice to sit at a table when there's no money involved because everybody talks. <laughs> you know, well, it's true. When there's money involved, everybody talks about the money. But when you talk about a creative idea, forget the money, and then say collectively we'll work on this together, it's amazing how people will sit at the table. You know, it was sort of interesting because the anger that we got from the nursing school at the beginning, you guys always treat us so badly, we're trying not to. We're trying to be, treat everybody as equals, and we apologize. And this, but their dean just came around uh, uh, unbelievably to the point of adding new faculty members and changing their curriculum and making sure they stayed accredited as they did in public health. Now, public health was very interesting because public health likes to do large populations, but their epidemiologists like to do households. So you had two different schools saying, well, why do we have to go to the households? We'll survey the whole community. And the other one saying, no, we want to go into the households. So it was very interesting discussions that we went through with public health, too. And it's also the old barriers of academia. We're tradition. We're tradition-based. So you got to break down some of the traditions to form new ones. Not get rid of all of them, but mold it. It's a, it's, it's a new millennium. It's a new time to do stuff. And it's time for us to turn around as medical professionals and say, this is what we need to do. Anybody else? Yes, hey. Um, so I was wondering, how, how do you assess if the students are adequately meeting the professionalism and social accountability criteria and what types of interventions do you do for students who aren't meeting those criteria? That's a very good point. Professional, uh, <clears throat> the professionalism is done by every faculty member in every class. Okay, it is, we have a strand that teaches this throughout the four years, but they are measured by that by each single faculty member, of which when their grades come out, they come out at the end of the period, so no faculty member's name is there. So the students know they have to be on their best. That was a question. Also that we can change perhaps behavior, but do we change values? That's where you have to measure values when you do your admissions criteria. When you do have a student that is having a problem, with, right away we intervene. We sit down, we uh, uh, counsel the student, offer them recommendations, and the next step is uh, incomplete grade suspension or failure. We take this very, very seriously with our students. And when they are told that from day one, that this is being measured. For the social accountability, that's measured in their service learning projects and as well as their capstone. What did you see and what are you doing about it? Are you just telling me that, no, I just referred them to a primary care doctor? Or one student that we had that was just a, uh, a wise ass at the beginning, when one of the families uh, had come down from New Jersey, been employed by a canning company for 12 years, they opened up a canning company in Meldley, Florida, which is right outside uh, Miami, still in Day County. Within six months, they closed the plant down, fired him, the family is left unemployed. Unemployed now for two years with no insurance. Multiple medical problems. The only ones employed right now in the family was the 18-year-old who was in, uh, finishing up high school, and another one had a part-time job. The two youngest kids had Medicaid, the parents had nothing. As a matter of fact, the parents saved their money to go back to their home country, which is the Dominican Republic, for medical care and come back, which is n not the best way to do medical care. This student's suggestion was they should move out of Florida. We thought that was neither funny nor appropriate. So what that happened with that student after he made a couple of those comments was very simple. He was given an incomplete and was given a project that he had to work in one of the inner city schools and start a class on, t on reading, because that was his interest, he was an English major. Well, the kid has actually turned around, apologized, said he thought he was funny, thought he was making these comments. And what we see with a lot of these things is that the, the, the students that I see today are twice as smart as I am, but they're half as mature. So the maturity levels aren't there, they don't have the life experiences. They walk around with, you know, cell phones, they talk to mom and dad every single day, you know. They, very few of them had to work their way through to get somewhere. They're very bright, 
But these are life lessons that need to be taught. So they need to know, because we know, we, we suspect that they will have the right values. So we orient their behaviors to be in the right direction. They're going to be physicians. They have to be team members, and they have to be team leaders. And they have to be leaders for society. And so that's how we intervene. If you all join me in thanking Dr. Thank you. Thank you.